My name is Stefan Deschain, and I'm the host of The Nature's Living Show. And my name is Samantha Graham, and I'm the podcast's producer. This is the YouTube version of the podcast. We make it available here for those who prefer this format. But podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Deezer, Overcast, and many, many other places. Please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information. But for now, enjoy this YouTube version of our podcast. On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, the 45th Nude Volleyball Super Bowl at Whitethorn. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Well, yes, I'm back. It's episode 77, and there hasn't been an episode since May of 2015, and it's now November of 2015. And uh, I apologize to you and to all listeners who have been waiting anxiously. I appreciate all the comments, all the emails, all the concerns, all the support, all the encouragement. Thank you. It's not because things have been going bad, quite the opposite. Everything is very well. Um, just, I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> I've gotten myself involved in too many things. And uh, these shows uh, take a while to record, and I actually have quite a bit recorded, quite a few, of I- quite a few ideas um, to put into shows. It's just the time that it takes to uh, edit and put it all together that's lacking. So I hope to try to catch up a little bit. And I hope to be better in the future, although I'm not sure if I can continue to do monthly episodes while going forward. But certainly I don't think I can do monthly episodes in the summer. Last year I got behind as well. Just too many things going on between the park, of course, and my involvement in the various organizations that I volunteer for. And things are going very well at Bear Oaks. It was a very good summer. But we, as a result of being good, there's been a lot of things going on, a lot of projects and a lot of initiatives and a lot of issues to be dealt with as well. Um, it's surprising. You know, just I think it was in August we got a, uh, a letter from the uh, fire department and they needed to get a certified letter uh, that our bridge, which goes over a little river called the Black River, was able to hold the weight of the... Uh, fire trucks that go over it. Now, if you looked underneath that bridge, you would know pretty intuitively that this bridge is going to take it. I mean, it has some many, many very large I-beams supporting it. But fair enough, I'm sure the government has to have more official documentation. And even though they've been driving over it for 10 years without complaining, I have perhaps the fact we've gotten bigger and more official means they had to uh, get more formal. Uh, so that involved doing some research, finding the engineer, getting quotes, arranging for a meeting, getting the reports, delivering it. Just one little project, one of many that just can just whittle away your time, particularly when you're not expecting it and you suddenly have to react. So again, I'm sorry. for It's not a lack of interest for not doing these shows up to now. It's just been the fact that there's only so many hours in the day and only so many days in the week as I'm discovering. So I hope I'm not pod fading. Um, I've I've heard this term. I heard the, the term very early on when I got into podcasting, and it means people are losing enthusiasm and energy and interest, and so their shows become less and less frequent. You know, they stop altogether, and that's not my plan. And I am interested, and I do uh, want to share with you these things that I see and hear, these people that I meet, and I have many other people that I want to interview. 
um, for myself because I enjoy talking to them, but also uh, because I like to share with the naturist community and I want to keep being an advocate for ethical naturism. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to White Thorn Lodge Super Bowl 45! We're here for you and you're here for us! Our men's final, we have a patented match that has gone on for about eight years now. Canada versus Tiki, let's give both teams a big round of applause! I've always wanted to go to the uh, Super Bowl, uh, volleyball Super Bowl at Whitethorn in Pennsylvania. I wanted to go for a number of years. You know, I've covered volleyball in a few places. There was the episode early, early on about nude volleyball. Um, and then uh, there was also one with Michelle Router. And Michelle joined us this year at Bear Oaks um, and helped us put together the uh, tournaments. And we keep growing and expanding and evolving them. But I wanted to see how this massive event, that is the nude volleyball Super Bowl, is being held. And this was the 45th year, and I didn't have any travel to do um, because it's the weekend after the uh, uh, Labor Day long weekend. It's often still busy, busy at the park, and often I'm traveling for work, uh, whether it's Bear Oaks work or my other work. But this year I was open, so I decided to join Peter Allison and a few others, and we got in a van and drove down, drove down to Pennsylvania. It's not too bad. It's about a five, five-and-a-half-hour drive um, if if you don't get caught at the border. A um, yeah, little digression, but uh, one of the folks in our van had gotten a uh, bone scan, and when you get a bone scan, they... Uh, inject you with a uh, radioactive isotope so they can take uh, good imagery of the inside of your bones looking for fractures. And um, apparently that stays in your body for a little while. And as we drove through the border from Canada to the U.S., lots of detectors seem to go off. Um, Can you imagine that? I mean, that's how sensitive the equipment is. They were able to detect a very small amount of radiation. I mean, these are these are radioactive isotopes are minute, but they were able to detect that even though she was sitting in the back of the van and we were driving through, uh, you know, uh, just uh, the booth, like a toll booth kind of set up at the customs uh, border. But that was enough to set off not just our customs agent, but the one next to us, which led to a one and a half hour, two hour delay as they set to scan all of us in our van to make sure we weren't smuggling in nuclear waste or nuclear bombs. So I guess it's good. It's good to know they're checking it out. At any rate, we drove down and uh, we stayed for the weekend. We actually arrived on, well, it, it, it should have been on Thursday night, but it was actually very early on Friday morning. And uh, it was beautiful on Friday. The weekend itself, unfortunately, was cold and rainy. Uh, which is possibly why there weren't as many people there this year as there have been other years. But there were still 994 people there for the 45th uh, Nude Volleyball Super Bowl, which meant about 60 teams. Um, and it, it was it was incredible. I mean, it's incredible just because of the sheer scale. Very few events, well, naturist events, but events in general are that big. Uh, White Thorn is a very large uh, park. They have a lot of space, but still, people were basically camping on top of each other. Um, Terry was very kind enough to lend uh, me and and my friends a a pop-up tent trailer to sleep in, and it was set up for us when we arrived. But we passed, uh, we had to go walk right by another trailer and, and a couple of tents before we would get to where our tent trailer was because people are camped to a three uh, deep on all the sites. There's no sites anymore. People are everywhere. There's just, I mean, you, with 994 people, that's not counting the members. That's just visitors. And everybody's staying overnight because of the distance and the remoteness of the club. You could imagine how big it is and how, what a massive event it is to, in terms of just the infrastructure you need, just space for everyone to stay. But the the toilets, the food, the directions, the management. I mean, and they were they did it very, very well. 
Um, if you haven't been following the Volleyball Super Bowl, um, you should know that it's it's been going around for a long time and it's become sort of the mecca for volleyball fans and new volleyball players. And it attracts young people. It attracts uh, high-caliber players. Um, I mean, in a way, some of what uh, you experience at uh, Volleyball Super Bowl at Whitethorn is is like the caricature of what naturism is, uh, the, the fantasy that it is supposed to be in some people's mind because there are lots of very, uh, very healthy, very athletic young people uh, because they are athletes. They are there to play and they are serious about the game and they're in fantastic shape. So you see lots of that around, which is, of course, the fantasy that is espoused by non-naturists about, you know, how that's what it's supposed to look like because that's what it looked like in the exploitive magazines. And this is probably as close as you get to that. But there is everybody. There is every age. Even I was playing in a team and I, I wasn't the worst player, I must say. <laughs> and we weren't the worst team. Um, which was it's kind of my only goal, is to not be the worst, not uh, suck the most. And we, But we had a good time, and that's what it was about. We, we went and played as amateurs, and we went to watch, and we had a nice time, despite the weather, despite the cold. People played, and they played close free many of them, in weather that I found pretty cold, that I've become pretty hardy. So I was quite impressed by that. But the most impressive part, of course, was the, uh, the, the athletes who were playing at the semi-pro, double-A, triple-A level. Um, I saw people jumping so high that the net was uh, basically at their waist. Um, I saw moves that I'd only seen in the Olympics. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun to watch as well. And uh, it was an incredible experience. And it, it, it's... The tournament started in 1971. Uh, Wayne and Betty Alwyn um, had been big fans of volleyball, and there were games and players and little tournaments all around the Northeast, and they wanted to organize a tournament that brings all the players. And so they made an agreement with White Thorn uh, to host the first one. It was in August of 71. And, uh, I mean, White Thorn, I'm sure at that point, was only 10 years old. So that probably seemed like a really good idea to bring a lot of people in. That would be good revenue uh, and get the club seen by people from the other clubs and maybe from the outside and to get a little bit more visitors and a little bit better reputation. And it was successful. Um, and shortly after that, they decided the best time to hold it was the, the weekend following Labor Day. And that, to this day, still the day occupies, except with the popularity growing, it has expanded um, to the fact that it's now really a whole week. The, the main, that weekend is still the main tournament, but the whole week before is full of events and people showing up early, making a vacation and party out of it. So it's a fascinating event. It's it's has had as many as 2,000 people attending, so double what we saw. Um, and... It's, it's great for the movement. It's great to see young people still participating and joining. Um, a lot of that is to do with the Tiki Tombas uh, group, which we'll talk about in a separate episode because they're, they deserve their own show. Um, but it's also because of the incredible organization and vision of the founders and the volunteers in the club who've been pushing for it. And with that, I sat down with uh, Betty. Wayne sadly passed away in 2012. But Betty, or Volleyball Betty as she's known, still plays a key part of the event. She's, you can see her everywhere, uh, talking, smiling, a very cheerful and friendly person. And she was kind enough to sit down with me and tell me a little bit more about what this meant for her. So if you just tell me the story of how you got started. Well, <laughs> my husband and I, Wayne, we were big into volleyball. We loved volleyball. And we were members here from 68, but they had no teams, but we had been, Wayne belonged to, we belonged to Penn Sylvan, and then we, we formed the Tri-State League that was between three clubs. And we made bylaws and everything, and that the rule was we traveled once a month to each club, and that was your club for the weekend. It got a chance for you to see another club. It was yours for the weekend, and there was no ground fees, and the host club made a dinner on Saturday night. And that kept up, and then uh, we started 
we did that tri-state, and then we started going to the Midwest, out here to Green Valley and those places to play, and we formed another lake. <laughs> so we had the two leagues going back and forth. We set the schedule, and we were there, and in 71, Whitethorn had nothing. They had one court, and uh, we came here. The president was our very good friend, and we asked him, could we bring the two leagues here to see who's the best? And uh, we like reduce rate and stuff like that. And we set up this, and he said yes. So we brought them here. I think the first year we had seven teams. Wayne and I both played in the first few Super Bowls, and we won the first one. I won my, I played for Pine Tree. <laughs> and it was, everybody liked it, and the president said, if you come back next year, I'll pay the court. So, okay, so it came back, and it just got popular and picked up. More and more people started to come. And it was, we only had two courts, but as the years went on, we, we built more courts, and I think the seventh Super Bowl, we set a record. It was bigger than the ESA convention. And Wayne and I decided to call it the Super Bowl of nude volleyball. And everybody says, you can't do that. You'll get in trouble with the Super Bowl, football Super Bowl. Well, Wayne says, we'll take a chance. We're too little. So it has been the Super Bowl of nude volleyball. And it kept growing, and we kept building more courts. And we attracted people. Well, I think in 77, we had uh, 68 teams. And that was getting up there. And in the 90s, we got up to 97 teams. And they don't register ahead. They come here. And when we built the sand courts, we started on Thursday, we'd put a sign up if you wanted to play on sand all weekend, and we'd get their roster ready Friday night. But all the other teams would come in here. And then one day we decided, <laughs> Wayne said, we'd always say good morning. So we had this big famous saying, they had the sign on the court, good morning, volleyball lovers. It was like a wake-up call at 7 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and they miss it today. <laughs> and I don't know, it just kept growing, more people coming, and, and I know already you couldn't walk on a Friday night. It was so crowded around here. But with the rain, this is one of the worst weather. It got hot, and, but it just kept, we've had people from Germany, Finland, and we also have a player, he still comes. When he was young, he tried out for the Olympic team. And we had ESPN here one time. They brought a team. And it was, they, they didn't win anything, but it was exciting, you know, to see them and everything. And I don't know, and then we had the opening ceremony started that. And that goes over big, you light the torch. And since my husband died, since Wayne died, they kind of get me to light the torch. And it's, it's kind of nice. I like it. It makes me feel good. So w when you started this, you weren't thinking of doing a national or even an international tournament. What do you think made it change into such an international and such a big thing? Because I think the way it was run, we didn't, they didn't have to be an ASA member. There was no cards checked. You could, cut, you could bring teams from a college. We used to get college, but all you had to do is play nude in a legalized nudist park. That was a requirement. It was a nude tournament. And a Youngstown radio station used to advertise this because I was coming home one time, and I, on, I had the radio, the station on, and they says, uh, oh, by the way, this is the Super Bowl of nude volleyball at Whitethorn Lodge, and it was very nice, so. And then we had the plaques over there for a while. We had a guy give out, we give the team a plaque, and in the early days, we, 
my husband used to get the trophies or the plaques we had because the club didn't have that much money, so mm -hmm. he would get them made and we had a painter paint them. And it just kept growing. <coughs> Sorry. It, it got, that's fine. It got, uh, I don't know, it got to be every, we, th we had the first two before Labor Day, the last week of August, because we were afraid after Labor Day, everybody, the kids are in school, and, but we decided to take a chance, and it paid off. Everybody, and they set their schedule. We, we don't dare change the date because people set their schedule from one year to another. And now the last five years or so, they have made it, uh, they still keep the rate reasonable. Mm -hmm. And there's no overnight fee. Mm -hmm. And it's first come, first serve, but it's got to be now. Every little area has their own, they know where they're going. And they have their own little section, which makes it nice. And then they started doing the threes and fours. And now it's a t they have a 10 day pass. You can come in for $175 a person. And that's till Monday at noon. You can come the Friday before Labor Day. And it's pretty good. And there's, we got excellent volleyball. And then we decided, after about uh, 12, let's see. After about the 12th Super Bowl, we decided we'd like to get paid referees. So we had a friend that refereed in the Youngstown area, and we hired him and he would bring so many referees. And that would keep the game going. And, and everybody plays on one team. And it's quite challenging to go around and take care of everything and watch everybody. But I'm good at that. You are. <laughs> so did you, in the 70s and in the 1980s, um, it was normal. Everybody expected to have to have an ASA car to get into a club. Did you have any troubles from the ASA or from Whitethorn because you were not requiring the card for the tournament? No, we worked that out, and uh, the ASA never got involved. We did not allow cameras hmm. because we got people from outside playing. They, this is the only time they came in and played Newt was when they came to the Super Bowl. And we would get a college teams from the different areas, Slippery Rock and all these places around here. And we wanted to protect them, so no cameras, no pictures. So Anner did not recognize us because we had those stipulations. But we were for the people. Did you ever get in trouble with the Super Bowl people? No. Never, heard, never got a letter or anything? No, we're too little. <laughs> That's what Wayne said. <laughs> no, we never got a problem. And... Their Super Bowl is 50th year this year, mm -hmm. and we st we started five years after them. <laughs> so you're almost never... you're almost as old as the Super Bowl, the football Super Bowl. Right, we're 45 years and. So, what do you think the future is? Well, if we keep working and doing the right things, I don't want the club to get greedy. We got some young ideas. They're trying to bring too much in. And I mean, let's do what we can do and keep the people happy because it's challenging out there. People are losing their jobs. And, I mean, the economy cut us back a little bit, but people find time to come. And I think the club will keep their, Wayne and I used to set the fees all the time. But then the club, they thought, they, the board thought they should do it. And I says, well, if you keep it, you know, keep it within range, I'll go along with that. And uh, we did little things like the one year, the fee was $18 a person to get in. So I went to the bank and got a bunch of $2 bills, and that was their change, and that gave us an idea what they spent in the area. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, of course, everybody drinks when they come in here. And uh, the state store, the liquor store over in this little town, Chippewa, I used to take flowers over there for them. And 
they would put them up because the flowers were decent and stuff. And that's, they came, one time they came out and they wanted to buy shirts. So and that week of Super Bowl, they would wear the, the Super Bowl shirts. And they said that was their biggest week in sales. <laughs> and uh, the local people seemed to treat us good and everything. We had people that let the batteries go dead, and we had these local people come in, and they were—they didn't gouge them or anything. You know, they were reasonable in price. And the fire company comes in, we have them. Did, did you make any mistakes? Did anything you did wrong that you, uh, or you didn't work because of it for whatever reason? Well, in the early years, if they were lost on Saturday, they were done. But then we got to thinking, it's a learning experience. And we thought, nobody can be eliminated on Saturday. So we didn't, you know. Everybody plays it, play on one team, and it works out good. You have to have a certain number. And, and the people are very cooperative. Good. You get into very few difficulties. And what advice would you give to other people who want to organize volleyball tournaments around the world? Well, it pays to advertise. My husband and I used to go out. The club would give us a few bucks for gas. And we would travel all around to the different... They weren't necessarily nudist clubs because we sent, we sent letters and we sent flowers out. We put it in a board and we advertised. And it was very good. Now we get the regular ones that know about it. And, uh, but uh, we would go, we went one time to Omaha, Nebraska. They were having an outdoor tournament. They had all these temporary courts set up and we went in and passed out flyers. And I mean, it, we, we were well received because, and, and if you keep a good tournament, run it, use your rules, Treat everybody nice. Don't hold your temper. I mean, I see people, sometimes they're in charge. They, you have to, I mean, people are people. If they do something, explain it to them. That's wrong. But, and, you know, because they don't like this and don't like that. And, and if they find somebody, they have to play on Saturday to play Sunday. There's no only Sunday players. And it's, of course, rules or guidelines. And that's what Wayne and I used. That was one thing that we did. Because if somebody had a death in a family, they had to go to a funeral or something, we, over, we made provisions for that. There's little things like that. You have to make provisions. And... You know what to do when the time happens, like somebody gets hurt and they're in the game, but they got to play with six. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, is there somebody here that hasn't played? Then they can play, but just to keep harmony. And it seemed to work for us. I thought we did a good, we tried to do a good job. We made, uh, when you get 600 volleyball players out here, <laughs> I mean, and then, and then the corn roast was always nice. I mean, that was something we, just little things that you give them a free corn roast, and it still goes on today. And did anybody ever think it was too big, that it, it needed to not grow so much? Yes. Wayne says, we're going to do what we can. We're going to... We're going to reach, we did 97 teams as high as we got, and we were going for 100. <laughs> but there was a lot of harmony. It was good. Now, despite the success of the uh, tournament itself, the club is a relatively small club. We had only uh, a few hundred members. And this one big event, of course, dwarfs all that, and they certainly have the space for it. But volleyball itself at the club uh, had been in a decline for a while. Until a few years ago when Terry, affectionately known as Hippie Terry, um, really brought volleyball back to the club outside of the Volleyball Super Bowl. 
and really uh, pushed for the development of better courts and more courts. Um, I mean, there was I think there was a dozen courts set up, uh, sand courts, grass courts, and several hard courts as well. And so I sat down with Terry, who is also a really wonderful uh, person to chat with. I love that mustache. Thank That's you. That's the first thing I want to say when you talk about <laughs> <laughs> So, Terry, I am told that uh, volleyball at Whitethorn was kind of on a decline, and you brought it back. How did you do that? We did that by just uh, inviting all the guests to come play at whatever level they did. It'd be friendly and invite people and just have fun. And that's we started doing it on uh, Saturdays because usually the Sundays is that's when we have our really good volleyball players. Yeah. But and, and then you get all these visitors and they start feeling welcome playing volleyball with us because we're not you know we didn't, didn't used to be that good but we are now <laughs> and now uh, it just grew from there. They started out just everybody having fun and then they our our play started getting really better. And then we started going to tournaments all around the country and uh, and advertise our camp and our team. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the the big tournament, like the, the White Thorn Super Bowl, that never really stopped. But right. the, in the club itself, there was a decline. Why do you think? Why do you think that was? Because this was always the heart of nudist volleyball. Some because there was too many good volleyball players, and people felt a little apprehensive to play against them. So once we started, they'd be playing over here, and then we'd say, okay, we'll bring you, we'll play down here. And then we're, there was a couple weekends where, okay, all the players would leave up there and go play with us because we're having more fun. That's, you know? So how did you make it more fun? How did you make people feel okay about playing? Just... Uh, we, we still play by the rules and, and everything and learning, but just... Does anybody have an ink pen? No, sorry, we don't. <laughs> but just uh, inviting everyone to play and making them feel comfortable, yeah. and just having a good time. No, no, no drama. No drama. <laughs> However you say. It. Yeah. Uh, and it just started with my buddy Farmer Rick and I, because people, you know, the good players they'd look at us like, "You're not playing with us." So we'd we'd pick up our own teams and just start playing. So we had teams of our own and like I said they'd be up here on hard court with just three people nobody to play against because they're all coming down playing with us because we're more fun I think that's a problem in the entire naturist nudist world is that you know it used to be volleyball was big everywhere but now it's it's declining I believe we're bringing it back here we have even on our off weekends we have all the courts filled sand courts and hard courts two hard courts <laughs> And then we built the extra sand court just to, uh, you know, after, after this, it just got done Labor Day. But after this year, there'll be, we're going to lower the net, make it a ladies' net. And we need more ladies to get involved in, in playing because um, they, they, they love it out. They love playing the volleyball. And, uh, and we'd tr like to get our children involved also. That's why we'd, you know, we'd like to lower the net and make it a little bit more lady and, and child friendly. Do you get kids involved even when they were little, like seven or eight years old? Yes. My grandson, both of my grandsons are come out every weekend. They don't play yet, but they're very interested. But there's children that grew up here, and uh, little T and, and uh, Kenny. Mm -hmm. They start. We started them playing, just having fun because nobody would let them play, and now they're they're like B players. So. How do you organize it? Do you guys just have? Do you have a time where you all get together? Do you organize actual games? Do you have challenges? What What is it you? How do you put it all together? We, we do uh, Friday night. We have it under the lights. That's for everybody to play and just have a good time. And it goes on till one o'clock in the morning. And Saturdays we do sand. That's for everybody also just to come and have a good time. And uh, just people know it's like we start setting up around eleven o'clock and everybody just gathers around and. The music goes on and the volleyball starts and that just goes from there till usually till dark. <laughs> and then turn the lights on and it goes after dark. Yeah, you've got some very impressive lights on those courts. <laughs> yes, we do. Thanks to my buddy, Mark, yes. What was the motivation for that? Because we can't play enough volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, why are you hippie, Terry? Well, 
because I got long, beautiful hair. You do. And it's just my hippie attitude. This is a nickname. That's and and I, I can't believe you got grandchildren. Oh, yes, I have grandchildren. And they're all... I have <clears throat> three generations of nudists here. My son, my daughter, and both of my grandsons and their spouses all come. And uh, my daughter and her boyfriend, soon to be... Whatever, you know. <laughs> they're all members. And why do you think volleyball is so great to play nude? There's a lot of sports. Because I played it with my clothes on and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but why volleyball? There's lots of sports. Well, we also play cornhole and horseshoes and bocce and tennis. Mm -hmm. It's just not volleyball. We have a lot of things we do here nude. And uh, we have, like I said, our beautiful swimming pool and our hot tub and sauna. And just, just being out in nature, period, is, that's, our, that's our goal. And we have beautiful trails, too. White Thorn, um, as I was saying, was uh, formed in 1961, and it's a cooperative club. Um, it's set in the hills of western Pennsylvania near the Ohio border. In fact, uh, they were telling me they just purchased some land that's adjacent to the club, which they may develop, which is actually in Ohio. It's in a mountain range that's known as the Appalachian Mountains, and that, that gives it this beautiful uh, rolling uh, terrain. I mean, wonderful walking around, lots of hiking trails going down the sides of the, the, these, these hills and valleys, uh, rich forest. and uh, you can, from, from the club, there's places where you can see for miles because of the valleys below and how high they are located. Um, it's... Uh, there's lots everywhere. They have over uh, 80 hectares, which uh, about 200 acres. Uh, lots of space. And the club itself is and has always been a cooperative club. Um, it was... Uh, it's and A cooperative club is an interesting club, and I think I've talked about it before, because in a cooperative club, everyone is expected to participate and give of their time and efforts, which is what keeps their uh, membership down. Membership is incredibly inexpensive at Whitethorn. Um, but you have to spend time and you have to donate and work for that as well. And there's no option to pay extra as there is in some clubs. You really have to work. And you have to be accepted. And the cooperative nature means also that everyone has to agree. And that's why, you know, in some clubs that I've seen, the development is really minimal. Big events like the Volleyball Super Bowl are shunned because the members want to keep the club for themselves. They want to keep it quiet. Um, they're not really that interested in visitors because visitors mean work and trouble. And they don't always spend a lot of time and money on infrastructure because it means they, sp they would have to pay more in dues. Um, but that wasn't true at Whitethorn. I saw a beautiful pool, I mean, which is obviously not very old, with a huge deck and a hot tub, two hot tubs, actually, a wonderful clubhouse, uh, facilities that are very well maintained and well built, uh, not shacks, but uh, brick walls and solid uh, double pane thermal windows. And they also have lots of camping spaces for visitors, rental cabins that are also very well built. So a really well put together club. They obviously managed to make it work. Now, I did hear from members that there's always conflict, there's disagreements, which is normal. It's democracy. Democracy is messy. Dictatorships are easier, as long as you like a dictator. Uh, but it seems to work for them. And they continue to do the Volleyball Super Bowl. And yeah, I've got to tell you, the number of volunteers... The smiles I got from the members who were volunteering, the helpfulness of everyone was incredible. They, it's, they, they mobilize a small army just from the making of food to feed, imagine feeding thousands of people potentially, uh, uh, nearly a thousand this time. Um, the cleaning that has to happen all the time, consistently all the time, not because people are messy, but because you just can't have a thousand people showering and using toilets without a mess happening. And those White Thorn members, I mean, they're, they're driving people around. They're always there. They, many of them, I'm sure, earn all of their hours and then some just volunteering for this weekend. But I wanted to know a little bit more about the origins of the club itself and where it came from. So I was privileged to sit down with Tex, uh, who is the, uh, Tex is the widowed husband of Kay, uh, who was one of the original founders of White Thorn Lodge. 
And he now is at the property, he has the old cabin that Kay had that was the administrative center for a long time for White Thorn. And uh, it was wonderful to sit down with Tex and hear about the club and where it came from and why it's so special to him. I'm L.B. Tex Reuter. Uh, my home club is Sunsport Gardens in uh, Florida, but I spend the summers at White Turn Lodge, and I've been doing that since 1983. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet a young lady. Uh, she was 81 at the time, named Kay Macesius. She was one of the original founders of White Thorn Lodge. She um, always said, just call me Kay. And she was a naturist, a true naturist. She always went barefooted, even out on the hot pavement, she could still walk barefooted. And she was responsible for many of the nature trails that are here in West Palm, or in uh, White Thorn. Uh, I first met her as a guest back in 83, and you rang the cowbell out by the front gate, and there was a like a barn gate that you opened, and she used this back room as the office for White Thorn Lodge and also for the Eastern Sunbathing Association. And she became a the secretary of the ESA at a time when um, before my time. But um, she has seen this place grow from the beginnings when it was what we really called a strip mine uh, <laughs> at a nudist club. But the flats that you see down here was a um, coal mine, strip mine. And then down in what we call the flats was another one. And there was an old farmhouse that sat over here, and we had a wooden hot tub that uh, looked like an oversized barrel with the top cut off. But um, there was a pulse. There was a heartbeat from those five original founders and participants that still beats today, 50-some uh, years later. And um, I think we can give them a lot of credit for what you see today with all the improvements that we have. So Whitethorn's always been a uh, cooperative, member-owned club, is that yes, right? it was. It started out as a cooperative, and we've kept it as a cooperative. Uh, our payroll is zero, and that's a fine thing. Of course, we hire people to build swimming pools and pave roads and things like that. But as far as the beautiful flowers and the maintenance of lawns and the courts are all taken care of by the members here. We have about 300 and some members, and um, they all seem to do a little, some do a lot more than others, of course. And what happens if some, say, are too busy and don't want to do anything? Well, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, people have been asked to leave in the past because they felt like they did not want to participate in the upkeep. But um, usually people do a little bit. As you can see my thumb, mm -hmm. I sliced onions for about five minutes and cut <laughs> And, um, of course, I'm to the age now where a lot of people say, oh, you're too old, you can't do that. But um, can, we, can I ask how old you are? I'm 95. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you. And um, I um, um, served my apprenticeship, and I washed dishes and uh, took care of the hot tub and things like that. But now I'm to the age where they think I'm too old to 
do much. <laughs> I just kind of watch. And what year did you first come here? Um, in 83, I first came. And then I did not, I visited it. And I fell in love with the place. And I guess it was probably six or seven years before I was able to come back again. But then I came to play volleyball. That was my my hook. I, I wanted to come up and play volleyball. And my daughter here uh, started coming with me. And we've come, you'll see all the trophies on the wall. We uh, we played a lot of volleyball, but I haven't played now for about uh, 12 years. Uh, and the uh, 45 years now of the White Thorn Super Bowl vo volleyball, yeah. is, uh, has that always been popular with the members? Yes, it has. It started out as the Tri-County, um, or Tri-State, and they had about six teams, and they didn't think that it would ever grow to be the world's largest nude volleyball um, tournament in, in the world. And it has been. At one time, we had as high as 95, 96 teams here. What do you think the future of White Thorn is? I think it's bright. Um, when you have a cooperative, everyone thinks that, and in actuality, are part owners. And they all want to have their say. And it's sometimes divergent. And uh, But all in all, I think it, it, it's bright. I, I would guess that if I were to live to be 145, another 50 years, I might find the same Super Bowl on the, the week after Labor Day. I think it's got a long life. So as you heard, Tex also is a uh, resident or visitor to uh, Sunsport uh, and Morley Schloss, who he knows very well. You've heard uh, my interviews with Morley Schloss in the past. Um, I have visited Sunsport, which uh, last winter as well, and I'll tell you more about that in an upcoming episode. But I find it interesting that there's these connections, the clubs I like and the people I meet that I seem to get along with and where the philosophies are similar. Um, there's connections, and uh, there certainly was here. That's all for this episode of the Naturist Living Show. Uh, thank you again for listening. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, sorry for not having so many shows. My name is Stefan Deschain and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. You can find links to uh, all the items I mentioned in the show notes. Um, it's on the website, which is at naturistliving, one word, dot, Bear Oaks, that's B-A-R-E, of course, bearoaks.ca. And uh, please keep sending your comments and your suggestions. I really appreciate getting them. Um, I appreciate all the support over the last eight months or so that you've been waiting for the next show. The show's email address, though, is still naturistliving at bareoaks.ca. Again, that's B-A-R-E, bareoaks.ca, because we are in Canada. You can also call and leave a comment. Take as many tries as you like, and you can even delete it if you're not happy. Um, I can't promise I'll use it, but I will definitely listen to it just as I read all of the emails you send. The show's phone number is 905-473-6060. If you're uh, outside of uh, North America, you uh, the country code is 1. And I'm at extension 333 because that's the main line for Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park. You can also call toll-free within North America, 1-888-373-9124. Again, extension 333 for the show. And you can also use Skype if you use Skype. The Skype name for Bear Oaks is Bear Oaks. That puts you back into the phone system. So then again, you dial extension 333. Join us again, probably only in a week or two, uh, for the next episode of the Nature's Living Show because I'm going to catch up and I have several more to do. This episode of the Nature's Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Nature's Park traditional naturist values in a modern setting. 
Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca. We hope you enjoyed this video. As we said at the beginning, podcasts are much more convenient when you subscribe and listen on a podcast app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Deezer, Overcast, and many, many other places. Please visit naturistlivingshow.com for more information on how to subscribe.